This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Dutch X, the fair and secure decentralized exchange platform by Gnosis. To learn how you can build dApps which leverage Dutch X's liquidity pool, visit epicenter.tv slash Dutch X. And by Microsoft Azure. Configure and deploy a consortium network in just a few clicks with pre-built configurations and enterprise-grade infrastructure. Spend less time on blockchain scaffolding and more time building your application. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. Hey, Meher. How's it going? It's going well. It's been a while since we've done this together. <laughs> yeah. I can't remember when. Yeah. I think I think Bloxrout was our last episode. Yeah. I think we've we've added a couple of new hosts. And I guess like, like the veterans are sort of busy trying to do episodes with the new hosts so that they get up to speed and you know uh, and we have a more diversified group of hosts for the future. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. And so our, our listeners will notice that the, the format's a little different. So uh, we don't typically sort of have this little discussion between us, but um, you know, we're, we're, exper- we're experimenting with, with this new way of doing the show. Uh, we just thought it, it's, it'd be nice to you know, be able to you know, spend a few minutes you know, before the actual interview to discuss about you know, what we're about to talk about, what, we're, what you're about to hear. Uh, so this is actually being recorded after the interview. So it, it's a good way to sort of frame the context for what you're about to hear. And also it gives us the opportunity to maybe talk to you about stuff that we, you know, we wouldn't normally uh, have the opportunity to talk to you about, like you know, events we might be going to or things that might be happening in and around Epicenter and this sort of thing. Um, so yeah, let us know what you think about this sort of new new format. I mean, it doesn't change much for you, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, hit us up on Twitter. And also, we'd love to hear what you think about our our new uh, our new hosts. Uh, I mean, Sonny's been here for a while. Uh, most of you are, are familiar with him, uh, but uh, Federica, who who just joined us recently, uh, we're super excited to have her on. Um, we're already this uh, I guess two episodes in with her, and uh, I think she's she's been great. So, yeah, what, what do you think, Mayor? No, it's it's great to have new hosts. Um, you know. Every new person brings a different perspective and I get to learn a lot as a host myself um, doing these episodes with Frederica and Sunny because their questions are so different from mine. Their curiosities are so different from mine. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it kind of uh, takes, takes the heat off of us and you know, it allows, uh, allows us to do other types of things uh, and, uh, and also for the listeners to, to be sort of kept on their feet as to you know, like, Who's going to be the next host uh, on like the next episode? What could I expect and sort of the dynamics that that creates? Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, I'm really excited, and hopefully we can get some more hosts on uh, at some point. So today we're going to be speaking with uh, Monica Quaintance, and Monica is uh, lead engineering and adoption strategy at Cadena, uh, and Cadena is um, a a company that came out of J.P. Morgan. Um, and uh, is building it's sort of it's sort of unique actually because it, it's 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 a company that's building a public network and also uh, private network technologies. You know, typically, so if you take like a hyperledger or something like that, or like a, well, maybe not Cosmos, but yeah, something like hyperledger. Uh, sort of companies that are traditionally in the private blockchain space that deal with enterprise clients. You know, they have a stack that they're looking to deploy in consortium networks or. Um, with enterprise um, players, but they're not typically like building a public network um, with like miners and you know privacy or sorry uh, um, uh, censorship resistance and such. But they're actually doing both those things. They're building a public network and they're building uh, an enterprise blockchain toolkit stack, whatever you want to call it. Um, so from that perspective, I thought it was it was uh, it was interesting. Um, I think you'll see that we sort of get into the weeds uh, with Monica because there was some some points where we didn't quite agree about some of the fundamental uh, underlying premises of uh, of their of their public uh, the public network and the the consensus network there the mining protocol. But uh, I think it was interesting then, nonetheless. Uh, what did you think, Mayor? This is kind of a unique episode for me because. 
I I saw the videos of Kadena and I chatted with Sunny uh on the epicenter slack prior to doing this episode and Sunny and I were like Kadena is claiming a nearly infinite scalable infinitely scalable proof of work blockchain you know in in one of their videos somebody asks them what's the limit to the scalability of your public platform and their answer is uh, you know that their limit is something like the limit of global bandwidth uh, that is available in the world is what will limit their platform like some some answer that goes into you know like the billions or trillions of transactions a second and and when like sunny and i like looked at it we felt that the scalability solution can't work um so i was actually i came into this episode hoping my doubts would be cleared and my skepticism would go but it really hasn't so i i guess like what i'm going to do is um you have the episode you can listen to it i get into the weeds with monica uh and i'm going to just write what i think as a comment on on youtube or on let's talk bitcoin so i, I want to do this because i sort of realize that people listen to epicenter episodes and they and some of them might put their money one way or another based on our episodes and if i feel if i have a critical opinion about something i just want to put it there and have a discussion about it so our our listeners see what's going on in the host's mind yeah yeah that's a it's a good way to do it um yeah for m- myself i i i hadn't discussed with sunny prior to the episode but i did uh you know read the white papers and yeah, there were there were some things that I also felt. I I think it was after the show where we were talking with her that maybe we were. There were some fundamental um, differences about how we were coming at the problem, and we really couldn't get to get to really um, put forth and agree on what we were disagreeing about, and yeah, maybe. Um, this is something that we can try to follow up with or uh, try to get a better understanding um, in, you know, discussions uh, uh, sort of off the show, but in on Twitter and social networks and stuff. So, yeah, here it is. Our interview with Monica Guaitens of Kadena. I forgot to mention two things. First, we are at Web3 this week in Berlin. So if you're in town at the at the event and you see us, come say hello. We'd be happy to see you. And we will be at DEFCON 4 in Prague next week, all week long. And we are hosting a meetup. It is the Decentralized Pumpkin Meetup. If you think pumpkins are too centralized, you should come have drinks with us and discuss this core issue. Uh, It is on October 31st, Halloween night, uh, between 7.30 and 9.30, right before the big Halloween party. So location is not quite figured out yet. But if you go to epicenter.tv slash DEFCON 4 and you sign up, we'll send you uh, a notification when we have a location. So see you at Web3 and see you at DEFCON. So we're here with Monica Quaintance, and Monica is Head of Engineering and Adoption Strategy at Cadena. Monica, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So Cadena is a company that uh, came out of uh, JP Morgan, and uh, we're going to be talking to Monica today about the work that Cadena is doing um, sort of in both public and private blockchain, uh, in both both of those ecosystems. Um, they are building a, pro- a public blockchain network uh, that is based on a new consensus model that they have engineered called ChainWeb. And they're also on the other side of that, uh, working on a private blockchain uh, infrastructure for enterprise. And so today we'll be getting into that uh, in detail with Monica. So first off, uh, perhaps let's get a bit of your background. Um, how did you get involved in blockchain technology? That's uh, I, I love asking people's crypto origin stories. So my, um, I actually, I worked with Will at the SEC once upon a time. We were both in the group that developed software to try to catch high frequency trading fraud. So the idea is that, you know, you need software products in order to analyze 
trading blotters. And so we were working on a team that built, Will wrote the first draft of something that actually got pushed out to a bunch of examiners where they can like upload a trade blotter and it teaches uh, examiners how to look for trading fraud. So that was, we were working there at the SEC and he was really burned out and I was looking for something new. So we both left at the same time and I went to go be a systems engineer for Rent the Runway, which is a fashion company based in New York. And he went to JP Morgan's blockchain research group, which was, he was the lead engineer there and was hired by Stu Popejoy. And so Will and Stu were working on the team that made Juno, which was originally proposed to become part of Hyperledger and then it didn't. And then it sort of eventually morphed into the team that worked on Quorum before they were doing that, Will and Stu were like, oh, we've made this really incredible thing, this private blockchain. We should turn that into a company. So they left and they started Cadena to originally make a private blockchain with a smart contract language. And then they're like, wait a minute, we have an opportunity here. We could take this smart contract language and we could put it on a public blockchain. And then so over time, we've evolved into this place where our product is actually just a blockchain that works for both public and private. So Will and Stu called me and said, hey, we're going to make a public blockchain. Do you want to come? We need a systems engineer and we need somebody who can talk to people about what engineering means. So, uh, yeah, that's I started in December of last year, which has been, I guess that's like 10 months now. It's been the longest 10 months of my life. <laughs> We do a lot of great stuff, a lot of good research, but it's also just like everything moves so fast. Interesting. So you mentioned you worked at a at a fashion company. How how has that experience informed anything that you're doing now at Kadena? So the I was on the team that was doing data infrastructure, and that was a we were taking it from a bare metal database to a distributed data cluster in the cloud. So I was working on this project. I was the tech lead for taking basically a an old school cluster in Secaucus, New Jersey and migrating that. So that was, it ended up being really useful because I can think about data and how it's structured and how it's stored and like what atomicity means and being able to, to replicate transactions. And so it, it actually translates pretty well to the idea of a blockchain. Uh, to, in my mind, a blockchain is not necessarily different from the database. It's just a data store that nobody administers. It has some particular rules about it, but at the end of the day, like it's just another distributed data store. I was not expecting uh, that experience to be uh, so informative. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's blocked in experience. But, uh, but more, more specifically, I think maybe uh, we could talk about your role at the SEC and what you were doing there and, and uh, how that sort of uh, that, that brought you into your trajectory into what you're doing now. So the the interesting thing about what we were doing at, at the SEC is that the their technology requirements are very high, but they have the the talent there needs to be roughly unfettered in order to do what they're doing. And this idea of trying to create sort of a, a tech incubator inside of a large government organization, we were at the forefront of that. And it didn't always, like, there's obviously friction there because engineers that have that are really brilliant and we had some incredible brilliant people on that team and a lot of them are still there the idea of of having to push the agenda for new tech the event horizon of new technology inside of a government organization that we had a lot of friction there so i actually didn't last very long will was there for almost two years i was only there for like four months <laughs> before will left and i was like i was just here to work with will who is, we've been friends basically since college. Cool. So shifting into Cadena, um, can you talk about some sort of the main projects that the company is working on? Yeah. So the, we've essentially have our hypothesis is that there is, you only need one blockchain. Instead of going around and trying to cobble together like, oh, I'm going to launch my token using Ethereum and then I'm going to write it in Solidity, but I might want to compile to Wasm and then I might want to have some sort of second layer scalability solution on top and then under, like, it's too confusing. It's too hard. Nobody wants to develop on that. It's not developer friendly. We're still at the build your own PC stage of 
computing right now where like it's for hobbyists and it's for people that like get excited about seeing all these weird tool stuff but we're not going to see real adoption and usage in blockchain land until we move away from like oh well you know you're not a real blockchain developer unless you build your own stack we are offering a stack that just works instead of building your own pc you can just go to the apple store and you can buy a mac and it'll just work and you can just do your development on top of it so we have our own smart contract language and we're building our own public blockchain and it already scales. It already has a base layer scaling solution. We're building all of our own tooling. So right now we're working on like a pretty developer IDE that has built in error messages, that has built in formal verification. We have a bunch of new developments around all how we use formal verification in our stack. And then we also have for the way that we deal with privacy and handling privacy solutions is we have, uh, you can have an Oracle out to our private blockchain. So you can share as much data with the public blockchain as you want to. And it just, it's all designed to work together. You don't have to go around and like find a bunch of third party solutions to try to do the thing that you're trying to do. So you mentioned that there should be only one blockchain and so you're building you're building this blockchain based off this idea called chain web uh how does so is it like do you intend to build these permission private blockchains using the work that was done at jp morgan these will be separate blockchains that connect into this system or has your focus entirely shifted to just a public chain we are still working on the private blockchain. We actually have a healthcare insurance consortium that's using our private blockchain right now in order to, they have an MVP and they're working on getting the pilot up and running between these different companies. And right now they're using it for doctor office information sharing. The idea is that each of these insurance companies get fined if they don't have correct information about like where a doctor is located and what insurance they're taking. So each of them have people that they spend money on that call all of the doctor, like every doctor, in order to try and figure out what the right information is. Obviously, they spend a ton of money doing this redundant work because they're all trying to do it. So phase one of this project is each of them instead can contribute to this ownerless system where they all benefit from the data. And right now there's a mechanism in it where they can everybody pays into the system by running their nodes and then they get rewarded for updating pieces of data. And then eventually the idea is that this project we will connect to the public blockchain and allow doctors to actually update their own information because then they don't get spammed with calls from every single insurance company and then they can get rewarded directly so the network can actually sustain itself in terms of data update and storage so th this is the kind of idea with like a private blockchain that connects to a public blockchain that really it's just one project it's the project where doctors and insurance companies can communicate with better data but it's connected of all these different pieces which is a private blockchain with our smart contract language on top that connects to a public blockchain interface you know the dutch have given us so much orange carrots bluetooth artificial hearts even donuts were invented by Dutch people. But they also gave us Dutch auctions, which as it turns out, are great for decentralized exchanges. Dutch X is a decentralized trading protocol for ERC-20 tokens, and it's invented, designed, and built by Gnosis. Current order book-based exchanges, whether centralized or decentralized, have a couple of issues. Miners and exchanges can front run a trade when they step in front of a large order to gain an economic advantage. Not to mention issues with securing funds, high listing fees, lack of liquidity, and pricing efficiencies. The Dutch X exchange platform uses a Dutch auction mechanism to determine the fair value for a token. And participants in a trade are encouraged to reveal their true willingness to pay, which eliminates front running. As a permissionless on-chain protocol, it's useful for bots and other smart contracts needing to exchange tokens. And Dutch X also acts as an oracle for dApps requiring a price feed. So to learn more, check out the documentation at epicenter.tv slash DutchX. Smart contracts are live on the Ethereum mainnet, so you can start building today. We'd like to thank Gnosis and DutchX for their support of Epicenter. I'd like to come back just to this thing you said earlier that that we would we should only have one blockchain. Um, as a software developer, I'm sure you can appreciate that you know we have multiple programming, you know, different programming languages from C++ to Java to JavaScript and uh, you know, things like PHP and Node and all these different programming languages sort of serve 
you know, specific use cases or specific type of application developments, you know, whether it be for web development or enterprise or you know, solidity for smart contracts and such. Um, I, I think that this analogy sort of overlaps quite well in the blockchain space. Um, one, because presumably there'll be many types of applications for blockchain, but also just because of the sheer nature of open source software and how things sort of fork and proliferate and people work on their own projects and build their own applications and such. Do you, uh, do you think that that really stands up that, you know, there could be a future where potentially we could only have one blockchain and everything else just vanishes? So I definitely did not say that we should only have one blockchain. What I was trying to say, and it may not have come out this way, was the idea that you should have the option to just have a thing that works. And I don't necessarily agree with like, there are multiple operating systems and people write in different languages. And we have lots of discussions about languages all of the time, but you don't have to build your own computer in order to do development right now. Like the onboarding pipeline for becoming a web developer, for example, is easy. You just, you go to the store and you buy a computer and then you like write your first app and it's not that hard. You don't have to understand how a computer works to write a web app. You don't need to, we want to get to the place where you don't have to necessarily understand like how cryptographic hashing works in order to build an app on a blockchain. That was the point that I was trying to make that right now the learning curve is too steep. It is too high. You have to like have an opinion on validator nodes and like what's the right structure. Do you want to use like distributed or do you want to use PBFT or like all of these things? Like people hear all these terms floating around, they get totally bewildered and we scare away otherwise perfectly good developers who would be great for our community with like balderdash around stupid stuff about consensus protocols. Like that stuff does not matter when you just want people to build something. I want to get the on-ramp from people learning about blockchain to building things on blockchain to be way easier. And I don't think that we're going to end up with one blockchain. In fact, I think that continuing to make like we, because of the way that interoperability works inside of our own protocol, mean that we are already set up to have interoperability with other projects, which means we're going to connect to the Cosmos hub and we're going to connect to Ethereum and you'll be able to launch your token on Ethereum, but have it, the, all of your transactions happen on top of Cadena. That's, that's the goal. So of course, uh, you want to build this main public network and because you want it to be accessible to developers of all kinds, um, you want it to be scalable, right? So that's why Cadena is focusing on scalability for its public chain. Yeah, we're we're focused on b the way that our architecture is set up. We actually get both scalability and security. the The design for Chainweb was originally proposed by people, not us. It was uh, probably the first paper that came out with something like that was for Blockrope, which came out and suggested a way of scaling Bitcoin for security purposes, where you could have two Bitcoins that share their proofs with each other, which would give you an additional security property. And we came up with this separately and then ended up coming back around to the same place where we proposed it for scalability and then realized that we also get this security feature. So yes, the idea is that you can just put something on chain web and not have to worry about whether it's going to scale out or not. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, chain web and this scalability and security solution. Um, I, like walk, uh, us, I usually... walk us through it. Walk us, walk us through how it works. I usually do this with diagrams because it's a uh, it's sometimes hard to visualize and I'm a very visual person but we can talk about it. So imagine bitcoin and the idea that you have a block and then your new block that you generate on top of that one has a reference back to the original block. Right? This is the idea of like hash linking or having a root or a tree like a merkle tree. Um so now imagine if you had two chains, then they each have their genesis block, and then they each start working on their first block. The first block for each of these chains would contain the proof, like just the hash, of the, their peer chain's previous block. So not only do they have a reference to their own previous block, they have a reference to their peer chain's previous block. You can see for two chains, this is a lot of messages, like you have exactly double 
the number of references as you do chains, and that's a lot. So the way that we scale this is by using a fixed graph structure. And at this point, people are like, oh, this makes you a DAG. My response is all blockchains are a DAG. So all of these projects like Hashgraph and Diota are what I like to call arbitrary DAGs, where they'll just pick like some neighbor that's listening, that's ready to receive a piece of information. We have a fixed graph structure where peer chains always communicate to the peer that they're supposed to talk to. And uh, the way this gives us the benefit of always having them communicate in the most efficient manner. Specifically, our graph structure with how we braid the chains together, we use solutions to the degree diameter problem, which is how do you have the largest order graph with a minimum number of messages between nodes, the degree, and the longest shortest hop is minimized. So that's like the, the shortest path between two points. What's the longest one of those? Minimize that number. So it allows for the fastest propagation of information out to all of the nodes. Now this is how we get it to be fast and how we get it to basically communicate with each other in an effective manner is by picking a fixed graph structure. And we have for each potential size of chain web, of which there are, you know, many, many, many different potential sizes, each of them we get to pick the most efficient structure per size. So I talk about the Peterson graph a lot because it's easy to visualize in your mind. It's 10 chains, each of those chains communicating with each other in a fixed graph structure with a degree of two and a diameter of two. So that's two messages per node and two block height to receive full information propagation from any node to any other node. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's let's unpack that. Like so, the way I'm I'm thinking of it is, so so imagine two chains. Let's say you have the Litecoin chain and you have the Monero chain, right? Um. So, so we don't have interoperability between different projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's not interoperable between different okay. projects. So okay. so I, I, what I'm trying to do is essentially start with like Litecoin and Monero strip away things we don't need like two coins let's strip that away and have one coin and then and slowly from from that starting point let's build cadena right so 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 imagine like you have let's let's just imagine you have like litecoin and monero and you have like two chains and these two two chains have two different coins today so one is litecoin the other is monero and somehow in Later on in Cadena, it's like we are going to remove the two coins and there's going to be a single coin. So can, can we just talk about cloning Bitcoin instead? Like you have Bitcoin and then you have another Bitcoin and they're both like, because the, the idea is that all of the chains are actually identical. They're completely identical in terms of how they maintain state, in terms of how you interact with it, in terms of what they support. Like they're all completely clones of each other. Okay, so, so there, Bitcoin, there are two and then you Bitcoins. Have like Bi Bi Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you have Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2. And so you have like two, these two blockchains. The, both are producing blocks, let's, let's say, at 10 minutes. And now let's say I'm a miner and in Bitcoin 1. I'm, I'm a miner in that chain. So I create a block. Uh, right. So what happens differently now in Cadena? So in, in, in Bitcoin, when I create a block in Bitcoin 1, I would reference only the previous block of Bitcoin 1. What would I do differently in Cadena? Right. So as a miner, we expect that everybody's best case scenario would be to mine all of the chains, all of the time. So as a miner, you're actually mining both Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2. You're trying to get a success on both chains, which from like a game theory perspective, you want to split your hashing power because you don't want to have a collision where you get a success. Like if you throw all 100 threads on the same to generating the same block, there's a non-zero possibility that you get a success on two of your threads at the same time, in which case you've wasted a bunch of hash power and you should have to throw one of them away. So instead, we posit that people are going to try to mine as many chains as possible all at the same time, because then they can have more potential successes all at the same time. So you as a miner would mine both Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2, and you're just like hammering away at both of them at the same time. 
So for example, if I have 100 ASIC machines, I'm putting 50 ASIC machines on Bitcoin one and then other 50 on Bitcoin two. Sure. Yeah. Right. Like something so like if, that. if you're mining Bitcoin one, your block that you're attempting to solve has in its header a reference to both the previous block in Bitcoin one and the previous block on Bitcoin two. Okay, so I create a block on Bitcoin one and it says when this block comes comes in, it references the previous block in Bitcoin one. And then it also says, oh, the last block that I had heard of in Bitcoin two was this. So put that in as, as, as well. Yes. Right. And similarly, some other miner that generates a block in Bitcoin two would have listened about my block in Bitcoin one and they would put the my hash of this block in Bitcoin one in their block when they create one in Bitcoin two. Yes, exactly. So information about each block in Bitcoin two ends up entering the Bitcoin one blockchain and information about each block in the Bitcoin one chain ends up entering Bitcoin two. Yes, exactly. And the, the benefit of doing this is twofold. One, it keeps the network from diverging. Because if you have to listen to your peer chains, then you have to very quickly come to, like, if there are two potential blocks on Bitcoin 1 and you're a miner on Bitcoin 2, when you hear about both of these blocks, you must immediately pick one. Because you can only include one of them as the truth of Bitcoin 1 in your next block. So it's a way of forcing forks to recombine faster. Because if there's a fork on Bitcoin 1, not only do the Bitcoin 1 miners have to pick one, but also all of the other peer chains, in this case, Bitcoin 2, have to pick one, which forces people to make decisions, which is what resolves forks. So that's one reason. The other reason is this allows us to share. This is how we propagate state between chains and which we do through symbol payment verification. So if I want, have an account on Bitcoin 1, and we're an account based, not UTXO based. So I have an account on Bitcoin 1, and I want to pay you, but you're on Bitcoin 2. The way that we do that is we write a smart contract, or I hate the term smart contract, but we can call it a smart contract, between the two of us on Bitcoin 1, in which I say, like, oh, I'm going to pay Meher uh, 1 token. And then it is signed to your account on Bitcoin 2. And then we put that in on Bitcoin 1. The proof of it propagates in the next block to Bitcoin 2, at which point you say, hey, I'm going to redeem my half of this smart contract on Bitcoin 2. I have destroyed the coins on Bitcoin 1 and they're gone. And then you redeem, which consumes the transaction ID for your half of the redemption for that smart contract. And then the coins get created on Bitcoin 2. So we're like, you could potentially have a case in which there are is a chain that has no tokens on it because it has no accounts or they're all empty. And then another chain could have all of the tokens and it doesn't matter because each chain maintains its own idea of state. And this is how we pass information from chain to chain. If you've listened to previous episodes with Marley Gray and Matt Kerner, you know that Microsoft is committed to providing enterprise grade tools and infrastructure for blockchain developers. Well, the Azure Blockchain Workbench is perfect for organizations building consortium networks. Take the Ethereum Proof of Authority template, for example. It's ideal for permission networks where consensus participants are known and reputable. Ethereum on Azure has on-chain network governance that leverages Parity's extensible Proof of Authority client. Each consortium member has the power to govern the network or delegate their consensus participants to a trusted operator. And Parity's WebAssembly support allows developers to write smart contracts in familiar languages like C, C++, and Rust. Azure Blockchain Workbench was created on the same principles that drive all production services in Azure, so you know you're relying on secure, redundant infrastructure that can scale. And with built-in services like authenticated APIs, off-chain databases, and secure key management services, you can scaffold your infrastructure in just a few hours. To learn more about Azure Blockchain Workbench and how Microsoft is advancing blockchain usability in enterprise, check out aka.ms slash epicenter and start building today. We'd like to thank Microsoft Azure for their support of Epicenter. On that topic, you mentioned earlier that as a miner, 
um, you should be mining on many chains. So if we stay on this example of Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2, and we extend that example to now Bitcoin N, so presumably you know, there's hundreds of chains perhaps. Uh, and as a miner, I'm, I'm distributing my hashing power uh, amongst all of these chains. Um, doesn't that create um, a, a, a bandwidth issue? I mean, because I mean, scalability in blockchain is fundamentally a networking issue. I mean, it's an issue of um, having sufficient bandwidth to propagate blocks quickly enough so that everybody can come to consensus around uh, what is the actual state of the chain. So if I'm a miner and I'm mining on 100 blocks or 100 uh, chains, rather, um, that not only consumes a lot of bandwidth on a network, but it creates congestion even sort of like at the entry point of my like my router, like in my um, or the switch in my in my networking facility. Um, how do you uh, how does Kadena or sorry Chain Web address this? Sure. So f first, we make the assumption that large mining pools exist. Which I, I think that it, the crypto anarchist who wants to believe that all Bitcoin is mined by like individual hackers with a GPU or something in their closet is like, it's a fallacy. We need to accept the fact that like <laughs> Bitcoin, large mining pools exist and they are going to mine the whole web because they can. And they're are essentially going to perform the function of uh, coordinating the header stream. And the header stream is just these messages that go across the network that say like, hey, I found a block and here's the hash of that block. And the header stream itself is very lightweight because it's very small hashes there that are being passed to each other. So if you wanted to only mine one chain, you could subscribe to the header stream. And yes, you'd have to make an assumption that the hashes that you're receiving are valid. But given the fact that we assume that there are large mining pools and that people will be penalized by people not believing them if they ever put out a hash that's not valid, then you know we believe that people will be able to only mine a small subset of the network if that's all that they can handle in terms of bandwidth. But that most of the mining will be taken up by people that are actually capable of handling the bandwidth. I don't know that that actually solves the, the networking problem at the network level. I mean, so, okay, potentially small uh, mining operations or individual miners might only mine one chain, but the broader issue is that the entire network needs to be able to visualize the state. And if those smaller miners or, don't, or miners like in remote areas that don't have the bandwidth can't access the information. So how, how, does, how do we secure the chain in that sense? What do you mean the information? Because they should be able to consume the header stream. The header stream is just small hashes being sent around to each other. And the, they're only the number of messages going from chain to chain that are the degree number of messages in the network. So the, for the Peterson graph, for example, which is 10 chains, then that's there are two for every node that sends two additional messages. So that's not... I, 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 think I guess I don't really understand your question. Yeah, I think Sebastian's question is, um, so today we have Bitcoin, and in today Bitcoin block size is 1 MB, right? So every 10 minutes, if I'm a Bitcoin miner, I must get 1 MB worth of data very quickly and build on top of it, right? So when somebody else creates a block, let's say, Monica, you create a block in New York, I must get that one MB of data very quickly because I want to build on top of it. Now, now I can scale Bitcoin by increasing the block size. So if we increase, let's say the block size from one MB to 100 MB, now I need to get this 100 MB of data very quickly, right? In order to be competitive. Now, what Sebastian is saying is now, if, so traditionally, traditionally when we talk about scaling, we, we, we want to reduce this requirement of 100 MB to something much lower, right? So, so right now, like let's say Bitcoin had a block size of 100 MB and you wanted to scale it using some other mechanism. What you would try to do is you, you would want to reduce 
the need for getting 100 MB of data to something lower like 10 MB. But in Kadena, it feels like because if I'm a Kadena miner and let's say I'm mining Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2, I would need to get 100 MB for Bitcoin 1 and I would need to get 100 MB for Bitcoin 2. But you don't need the 100 MB for Bitcoin 2. All you need is the like one byte or like 64 bytes. No, but if I... But like your assumption is each mining pool is mining all of the networks. So they're mining Bitcoin one as one as, as well as Bitcoin two. And if I need to actually mine both those networks, I need to get data from both chains. So it doesn't solve scaling because all it, all it is equivalent to is, a, is an increase in block size. Like I could increase Bitcoin's block size from 100 MB to 200 MB. Or I could split it into two networks, Bitcoin 1 and Bitcoin 2 of 100 MB each. In both cases, I need to get that 200 MB of data in order to actually run my mining operation. Yes, I agree with the idea that if you wanted to mine the entire network, you would still need to be able to have all the data. But that's the same problem that we have right now in terms of people just wanting to be able to pump out more Bitcoin blocks or make bigger Bitcoin blocks. But this is, if you don't, you don't have to mine the entire network, you can mine a subset of the network, which means you don't have to consume all of the data. You could mine only one chain and then just listen to the header stream for everybody else's successes, in which case you would only need to receive, if we're using 200 as our example, then you would only need 100 megs from the previous block and all of the others you could just listen in for. So if bandwidth is your problem, then you can only subscribe to a subset. Yes. Yeah, so, so actually like that, that makes total sense, right? So, so the trade-off is if I, as a miner need to mine all the chains, then I need to get the data of all the chains. And if all miners are forced to get the data of all the chains, Kadena boils down to like a single blockchain with an extremely large block size, right? So that's not scalable. So the the point at which Kadena would be scalable is if I, uh, if me as a miner is given the choice of needing to mine only one chain and forgetting about the other chain. And then I need to listen to only one chain, listen to a smaller data stream and other miners can work on that other chain and then there is scalability. So I, I actually agree that, yeah, that's the that's the fundamental trade-off that in, in order for a system like Kadena to actually scale, really scale, you would need to concentrate miners into certain chains. Like, hey, miners 35, 39, and 38, focus on blockchain number 23, U5 miners focus on some other chain, and so on. Would you agree with that? Yes, and I think that it seems like I should build a timing and bandwidth consideration into our mining model right now because we're doing a bunch of Markov simulations on like ex- what people's expected value is on mining different chains and that right now at the moment we have it where the penalty for switching between mining different chains is very low, which causes our model to suggest that people are going to basically hop to mining whichever chain they think received the last, the least attention last round. And with that, as I, I mean, I could just go in and dial in different assumptions into, and right now I don't think we've necessarily considered bandwidth as being a huge lever, but if you think that that's interesting, like totally think that that's a worthwhile suggestion. From from my perspective, I think bandwidth is is sort of the fundamental um, barrier to to scalability at, at the at the lowest level. Um, I mean, any any solution that we try to build on top um, of existing blockchain to create more efficient um, blockchain systems, whether it be proof of work or proof of stake, what we're trying to do essentially is minimize the amount of bandwidth that needs to go from validators that maintain the chain um so it's, for me it's sort of a it's sort of a fundamental thing in in the scalability discussion in a broader sense that most people are not addressing so we've we've had some um we had a pro- project done recently uh blocks route sort of building a 
uh, content distribution network for for blockchains that, that addresses this issue at the the fundamental um, network level. Uh, but I haven't I haven't seen any other projects, uh, at least the ones that we had on, that sort of look at scaling from this perspective. So you've written a white paper uh, which describes the um, the different attack vectors uh, possible with chain web and the ways you mitigate them. Could you run us through some of these and um, how you're mitigating those uh, those attack vectors? Sure. So the the first one that we started looking at because it's it's like the fundamental, it, like the first one described in the Bitcoin white paper and all this is about 51% attacks and how like basically everybody's screwed if somebody gets 51% control of your network and fine. But um, if they don't have 51%, but they have less percentage of your network, how does that mitigate the potential likelihood of somebody being able to attack your chain? And uh, so when it comes to double spend attacks, because of these shared references between chains where like Bitcoin 2 has the hash of Bitcoin 1 in it, not only does it quickly force you to resolve any potential forks, but also as block depth increases and the block that's being attacked gets further in the buried, not only by blocks on its own chain, but by peer chains that reference it also getting buried. You you start having to not only replace at any given chain, but you also have to replace any peer chains that happen to reference it. So when we started looking into strategies that would require some that somebody would use in order to replace a block and do a double spend attack, they have to honestly mine the network in order to generate peer blocks, like more than 60% of their hash power actually has to go to honestly mine the network in order to try to attack the network. And they just, they exponentially fall behind in terms of that attack, that that's not really a feasible situation. Well, that was the first one that we looked at. This is the whole, like, the block rope originally produced this chains sharing each other's hashes as a security measure. That's how that really gets exposed. That's how we come up with the term. Um, we use the term Merkle cone because it's like Merkle tree, but it has an additional dimension on top of it. So it's because of the way that the Merkle cone propagates exponentially across all these different peer chains, double spend attacks are, are very hard. Okay, that, that's that, that sounds like an interesting proposition. So like in let's say like you have like a Cadena network and you have 10 chains in this Cadena network, right? And you know, like the total mining power in this whole network is X, like I don't know, X tera hashes uh, or X, X whatever unit, right? You can think of it like thousand tera hashes, right? some large number. And then you have Cadena chain one, K1, you have Cadena chain two, K2, and you have up till Cadena chain 10, K10. So, and the total hashing power is thousand tera hashes. Is it the case that Cadena 1 gets 100 tera hash, Cadena 2 gets 200 tera hash, and these thousand are distributed equally between the chains? Or how does mining power get distributed across these chains? So it's the, it's the miner's choice which chains to mine. And this is part of what the simulation project that we've been working on in terms of uh, building the, the model for the network graph and then building the miner graph and then having them run through simulations on how they would mine. That our, we posit, obviously, we haven't built it yet, so all of this is still simulation land, but that the network, when actually stabilizes to a point where they're all roughly equal because any chain that you think has less hash power becomes an attractive target. So you want, if your chain, if you think that people, a lot of people are mining a chain that you're on, then you're competing too much and you want to hop to a chain where the collective hashing power is lower, which actually causes the entire network to, to stabilize. There also the fact that you have to wait for the, the blocks to be finished on your peer chains before you can include their proofs in your header serves to, it's sort of like you've tied them all together in this three-legged race where they can't get too far ahead. You can only get diameter number of blocks ahead 
of the network as a whole, which means that any chain can only fall diameter number of blocks behind before it starts to slow everybody else down, which then causes people to dogpile onto the chain that's holding them back. So this is the like the the balancing network. We haven't we've called it given this event horizon of blocks various names. Our uh, lead chain web engineer calls it the cut set, which I think is sort of a weird term. I was calling it the meniscus for a while. Nobody liked that one. Nobody liked meniscus. <laughs> So uh, I've, I'm going with Event Horizon for now, which is the, like the, the latest block for all of the chains and where they are. And th this is the idea that the hashing power will pool to the lowest chain because that's the one that is the most attractive. So, so that's an interesting idea. So the, the basic idea is that uh, you somehow want, so you have these 10 chains and you somehow want these chains to progress at similar speeds. So if, uh, if, a block is created here, you want the other chains to create blocks. And so what you're effectively doing is you're somehow incentivizing the miners to switch to the slowest chain so that the whole system can um, make progress. And when the miners switch to the slowest chain, automatically the hash power distributes equally. So, right. so you start with, let's say a thousand tera hashes and you end up with a system where there's like 100 tera hashes equally across all the chains. Right. right? So, yeah. or it won't, it won't be exactly equal, but like some might have 80, some might have 120, things like that, but like it, you will aim to get like somewhat equal distribution. Now the question becomes that suppose now I'm a miner on chain five, right? So I'm a miner on chain five and I'm, I'm a, I'm a large miner. And now chain five has 80, 80, like 80 tera hashes, right? Now I'm a large miner and my mining capacity, right now I'm not mining Kadena, but my mining capacity is 100 tera hashes, right? I can 51% attack chain five because those guys are 80 and I have 100 pointed waiting to go. So what I do here is I'd say, okay, let me put those 100 on just chain five and let me just create one invalid transaction that creates, I don't know, a billion cadena and just gives it to me. And I basically create that block very quickly on chain five. And because my block appears quickly because I have more hash power than the others, that invalid block propagates to chain seven, eight, two, and one. And they include my invalid block when they create their next block. And so my block becomes canonical. Do you think this is a problem? So the way that that would become resolved in chain web is like, you're not the only miner on chain five. Somebody else will attempt to validate your block as a way of putting the bl next block on top of chain five and see that your block isn't actually valid. In which case, they will suggest this as an alternative. And since people are mining, like you would mine a subset of chains, mine like chains five, six, and seven, then somebody who's mining five, six, and seven sees that like five is actually not a valid block and will suggest an alternative block and include that in six and seven. And then whoever is also mining six and seven will see this other proposed block five and that it's not included in this other proposed block six, which will then cause them to reject that block five and the block six that includes a reference to the bad block five. Like th this idea that a bad block would never be validated by another miner is like, I think the core of why that doesn't necessarily work. So what, what you're saying is now you're going to use the other chains as a judiciary of kinds, right? So I'm the, I'm the big bad, bad attacker. And let's say Sebastian represent the honest miners of chain five. I'm the attacker of chain five. And so I was fast because I have more hashing power. I produce the block right. quickly. It broadcast quickly. Now you're saying like, oh, Sebastian, but we'll also create a competing block and try to broadcast it. Right. Now, now the whole network chains one to 10 must decide is Meher's block canonical or Sebastian's block canonical. So 
the whole network in in some senses needs to become a judiciary yes right but they can be a judiciary only if they know if only if they store the whole blockchain of chain 5 but only if they're mining a small a subset of any connected subset of the network like 5 6 and 7 or 3 4 and 5 or so, because so let, let's say i i propagate my hash to from 1 to 8 blocks chains 1 to 8 here my thing and sebastian thinks sebastian's honest thing goes only to 9 and 10 i win well but then it'll go to 9 and 10 and then 9 will have to reconcile with 8 and then you'll have to go and you'll pick which one of these either 9 or 8 so th- this is because of the way that it's webbed together you have to make calls very fast and yes we assume that people are mining more than one chain which allows them to cross check each other if everybody only mined one chain then we would have a problem but because it's designed for people to to hop between chains and mine more than one chain it forces them to reconcile with each other i mean let's let's move on to some other topic but i feel like the fundamental issue with cadena is is exactly this it is it is that in order for reconciliation to work um you start to need bigger and bigger juries and ultimately you'll boil down to the system where everybody needs to mine every chain which means everybody needs to get the data from every chain which means actually it it will not end up solving scalability i don't think that everybody needs to mine every chain but that's that's a fair critique yeah okay so let's move on to the next theme sebastian so there was a i i wanted to come back to this earlier in, in our discussion uh but we sort of got sidetracked with these other topics but th- there was one passage in, in the white paper that 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 kind of struck me um and i wanted to maybe get get you to uh, perhaps explain it in 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 your own words um so in on page 2 there's a section where you talk about proof of stake and proof of work and you argue that um proof of stake validators would be subject to um uh, money transmitter uh regulation at least in the US uh as it, as it reads here can you expand on this logic and what what evidence you have to support this this claim that proof of stake validators would likely be subject to money transfer regulations. Sure. So this is um the reason that we take this position is the idea that right now it's too it takes too long and it's too hard to pass new laws to try to regulate blockchain. And it's going to take a while in order to get new legislation out there especially in the United States where these things take forever and people debate about them for a long time that trying to pass new laws for blockchain is going to take a while so the only way that people are going to try to regulate blockchain for at least the short term is to try to apply existing legislation to blockchain and the way that existing legislation works for money transmitters is essentially if you put money up and we know who you are and then you clear a transaction that sends money to like al qaeda or something that we should punish you because you are enabling money transmissions to somebody who's sketchy so when it comes to proof of work miners because they don't necessarily have any stake in the network and we don't necessarily know who they are if they clear a transaction by mining that sends money to al qaeda then it's not their fault because they weren't actually being a money transmitter because they didn't put any money up and we don't know who they are but when it comes to proof of stake part of the argument about making proof of stake work is that you had to prove your identity and you had to stake some sort of amount of money and because you put up that money and then you sent money to al qaeda you can fall under existing money translator legislation much easier than a miner who doesn't look like what the law already considers to be a money transmitter so that's why this area it's that the shape of staking looks a lot like the shape of existing money transmitter legislation whereas the shape of mining doesn't look 
very similar to existing money transmitter laws. So that's why we're concerned about validation in general. Like all of these services where a fund is trying to turn their fund into being a validator on like EOS or something, where they then clear a transaction that then causes, I don't know, something illegal, that they could be held liable for it. I mean, so don't you think that um, if this were the case, if, if regulators really wanted to go after after Bitcoin, I mean, like, I mean, Bitcoin in the eyes of U.S. regulators, I would say, I mean, to some extent, perhaps not everyone, but to some extent, Bitcoin is seen as um, a currency where a lot of illicit transactions occur or at least have occurred in the past. Don't you think that regulators could just go after mining pools that because we know where mining is con concentrated, where they could um, force mining pools to do KYC on the miners uh, that access the pool? I don't think that legally they could make that case right now, that mining is money transmission. But I do think that they can make the case that validating is money transmission. That's that's our stance on it, that validating looks really similar to existing legislation and mining does not. Mira, I think you'll have lots to say about this. Yeah, and <laughs> this is because like the validator is identified with one public key, whereas a miner is not. Yeah, or that a miner may not even be participating in the network necessarily. They could just be mining a block with their hashing power and then immediately selling all their Bitcoin and they don't care about like staking money in the network. It's this this like staking thing that is the that is the problem because then it looks like being having a money transmitter license is like, you know, you staked a bunch of cash in order for somebody to then be able to use you as a transmitter. That's what that shape starts to look like. Yeah, but I, I would say that that up, I mean, the the obfuscation of identity that you have in Bitcoin mining can be, I mean, you, you, can, repli you can replicate that obfuscation in proof of stake as well. I mean, you, okay, you may have uh, a key, uh, but I mean, you can pretty easily, I, I would say, change that uh, that key for the next round of validations and the the um the validator that's taking stake from from delegators doesn't necessarily have the identity on this for doing some sort of kyc of uh the delegators themselves so I mean, it's uh, the it's the probabilistic nature of proof of work that really gives it the the slipperiness because as a bitcoin miner there's always a non-zero chance that the block that you confirmed might not actually be the real confirmation. It's this like invalidating, you actually have to vote and then the vote is confirmed and you have finality. It's the finality thing that really makes it a certified transition with your name on it. In Bitcoin, it's like there's always some probability as to whether you did or did not confirm it and it's not really a line in the sand. It's this finality issue that actually makes it slippery. That's a very interesting argument, I must say. Like that's, that's something enti that's an entirely new way of looking at it. So you, what you're saying is, if I'm a miner in Bitcoin and I created this block, it had a bunch of transactions and I published it. I can argue that I published some data, but I wasn't hundred percent sure it was going to be included in the Bitcoin blockchain. It could have been orphaned, so I wasn't processing transactions. I was just publishing data. And because I didn't have certainty that that data would go into Bitcoin, I'm not transmitting money. But in proof of stake, if I vote on a block and after my vote, the block gets finalized. So let's say like the voting has happened and I cast the determining vote that finalized that block. And what I'm essentially doing is in the process of voting, I'm making the transactions final. And that makes me more like a money transmitter because while I was publishing that data, I knew that if I publish it, these transactions would be considered final. Yeah. That's super interesting. <laughs> I, must say. I, I, I don't know if the regulators are going to look at it like this or not. Who knows? But I mean, that's our interpretation. We just think that proof of work is safer because it has this other like dimensional element to it. And I really don't want to go to jail. I'm sure like the proof of stake designers, um, so, you know, like, you know, like in Cosmos, 
So I'm actually building a Cosmos validator. So this is a topic that's like really close to my heart. Uh, in Cosmos, yes, like the validator, it could be doing things that are like casting votes. It's like you know, or like you know, in in Cosmos, sixty six percent of the network has to cast a cast a yes vote for the block to go in the chain and be final. So let's say you know, like sixty five percent has done, and then like my validator casts that decisive vote that switches it over to 66% and then creates a new block that takes uh, that vote as final then maybe there maybe there could be this element that yes I, I i did put the deciding vote in there the validator did put the deciding vote in there but i think if you look at something like tezos that argument would be quite weak in tezos because in tezos uh, even if you create a block that block is not final until like 10 or 20 blocks are built on top of your block it's like bitcoin so cosmos is not like bitcoin the block is final and you don't need to have more blocks on top of it to be final but in tezos it's like like bitcoin where you need 10 things to come on top of yours before it gets considered final so if that's the argument then tezos baker is fine but a cosmos validator may not be so that that will be, will be quite interesting I actually love Cosmos. I think Cosmos is a great project. And I think Zaki is amazing and their whole team is great. So just because we're not proof of stake doesn't mean that necessarily we're like fundamentally theologically opposed to proof of stake. If we look at sort of the blockchain ecosystem at the moment, uh, we can start to discern some, 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 some applications and use cases for each one. You know, Bitcoin is sort of shaping up to be a, a digital gold, right, an, an asset uh, that that you keep and that you know, will gain value uh, within the future. Uh, Ethereum is shaping up to be, at least in the initial use case, is you know, project funding, etc. What is what is the use case here for for Chainweb? What's what's the application that you're hoping will emerge as like the killer application for Chainweb? So I I like to talk about the the like blockchain as a stack where for example if you were going to launch a project and you wanted to do a token sale and then you wanted to have an application that would be able to move a bunch of transactions through your app and then you would sell your token on Ethereum but you would want to program your app in Pact and have your transactions run through Chainweb because we posit that we're going to have much higher throughput and therefore much lower transaction fees and we will be able to handle high volume transactions in a way that right now ethereum you're, you're sort of struggling to have a high volume of transactions and we we would like to have the ability to have interoperability between all of these other different layers of the blockchain stack. If you wanted to launch your token on ETH, we would want to be the computer underneath because we have a super simple smart contract language that we think is very easy and has really nice tooling on top of a chain that will be able to handle your throughput. So we're very conscious of your time here, and we we wanted to spend some time on Pact, but uh, I think we might have to leave that for a, for a future episode. Um, okay, give me I, like two minutes unpacked. Okay, sure. Because yeah. it's really cool and really everybody should go and take a look at it. We have the developer SDKs are up. You can like treat your computer as if it were a tiny node and write packed right now. It's so we've taken like basically the completely opposite track from Solidity and all of this like virtual machine land where we're trying to replicate an entire computer on a blockchain. It is non Turing complete on purpose. It's more like SQL for the blockchain instead of SQL for a database. We have Pact for blockchain. And it has all the things like key signatures and governance and who owns what and who can change what. All of that is built in automatically. It has a full formal verification spec. And we have this really awesome thing now that we've just developed called verifiable interfaces, where you can essentially like program what an ERC-20 should look like and give it a bunch of specs. And then if somebody implements it incorrectly, it will warn them like, oh, your ERC-20 equivalent is actually malformed. So you can, can't have like we did this summer, a bunch of like bad ERC-20s that come out. So all of that stuff all built in already. Pact is like, I could spend a whole nother hour talking about it, but we can talk about it another time. 
Yeah, uh, well, perhaps we can have you on in the future to, uh, to, to go more in depth on Pact. Because, uh, I mean, Chainweb did take a while to unpack here, unpacked. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I did want to spend some time on on uh, on Kadena and, and your private blockchain um, offering. Uh, so how, how does Kadena interact with, with Chainweb? And what's the goal here uh, with regards to the types of clients that you're approaching with this um, with this platform? Yeah, so we have we have two signed clients right now that we're working with. One of them is this uh, healthcare insurance project that we've already I've already talked about briefly. But in general, the idea is that we want to be a way of onboarding existing businesses and new business applications from private to public in a way that is safe and secure and is a way of unlocking sort of existing business value in a new way, new liquidity pipeline. So I talked about the health insurance one where, you know, you can pay doctors to update their own information. We've also talked to a bunch of different companies. Some of them are, some of them are cooler than others. <laughs> Our other big client right now is a reinsurance company that does insurance products they do like home insurance and stuff and uh, so we've been discussing with them something where they can have a a broader pipeline for validating their auditor data so using like third-party auditors that can contribute data in a more tightly verified way to their pipeline so that they can have a better less leakage in their insurance flow basically so th we have the side where we deal mostly with private and then we also have a focus on dealing with public and then everything in between. So uh, we talked about the idea of connecting a smart TV to the wall and then having a people in public on the public blockchain get paid like $5 off their Netflix subscription or something in order to provide their smart TV data to a private blockchain that would then use that information, which would be better than what we have now because right now, like who knows who's looking at your data and what you're providing them. This would give you control over your own data, which you could monetize in public, but then they could mine in private. And so there's, we have this idea that there's not private and public, there's just one blockchain with different permissions. So to, to touch on this, in the, in the white paper, um, you, 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 there's a part there where it references sort of uh, the, the scalability benefits of Kadena in a private setting. Uh, and it makes reference to sort of five to 15,000 nodes as being you know, the threshold where it begins to exhibit linear scalability, I mean, which is sort of you know, expected at some point that your system is going to stop scaling exponentially and, and, and more uh, linearly. But given, given that you know, a, a network like Bitcoin, you know, as I just looked up uh, earlier, has about 10,000 nodes, at, at what point does a network like, go from being a private network to just being another public network um, does it preserve the benefits uh, that sort of the you know, initial consortium or set of clients uh, set out to um, to implement? And what, where's the line there, like where where you sort of switch from being one to the other? Mm -hmm. So the our simulations for scalable BFT, which is our private consensus mechanism, is. We, we've never run a simulation more than 500 nodes, but given that our other options for people trying to do private blockchain right now are like Hyperledger that doesn't scale past four nodes and Corda, which isn't even really a blockchain and all of these like other private blockchain technologies, like we fundamentally believe that we have a better private blockchain than anybody else right now. And that the idea is that you would for one of these applications, start it in scalable BFT in the consortium model. And then as you see the potential benefits of unlocking some of these pieces of data into public, you can connect them to the public chain. So it's more about how you want to monetize your data. If it's still the idea that you want to share in a consortium model, like we can scale that out for some certain amount of time, but it's still a permissioned model. Whereas if you wanted to allow exposure to some of these pieces of data to the public, like we're talking to a, a fund right now that creates uh, products for people to put in their like mutual fund portfolios. 
it's not treasury bonds, but it's sort of like treasury bonds. They want to create a tokenized representation of one of their funds. So that would be a public representation of a private blockchain that represents an asset, if that makes any sense. So I, I wanted to take this opportunity to to ask you, uh, you know, your thoughts and opinions about sort of where we stand right now with regards to enterprise blockchain, permission blockchain, what have you. Previously, I co-founded a company that uh, sold, I guess, enterprise blockchain solutions for traceability to uh, do large insurance companies, you know, companies in the finance sector. And I, I came out of that with um, having been confronted with the, 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 the challenge of implementing blockchain in enterprise, um, sort of skeptical. Uh, to like where things are going in this space right now. And you know, I could point through a few things. Um, namely is that blockchain is sort of orthogonal to a lot of the business models in, um, in finance, uh, mostly in the financial sector, whether it be insurance or banking or financial services. Uh, and al although a lot, of, a lot of companies obviously are paying attention to blockchain and experimenting with proof of concepts, et cetera, um, none, of the, none of that has really panned out. And, you know, We've been saying for about three years that like that enterprise is going to start adopting blockchain, but even the largest consulting companies like IBM have been pumping out POCs and are struggling to convert those into um, production systems. And I think mo mostly it's because of this orthogonal nature of what blockchains represent to large companies and just failing to see the ROI, I guess, um, as everybody is joining consortiums and trying to figure out like what they're going to do next. Why is Cardena different um, in this sense? And like, what's your, what's your go-to-market strategy for bringing customers on board, consortiums on board, and then converting them over to sort of this public, this more public network as you described it? So our, our vision for Cardena as a whole is that we, because of how our smart contracts function, you can essentially create importable services. So stick with me here and I'm going to tie it back to enterprise. But imagine on the public chain that you have building block services that provide a, a network that gives you a lot of flexibility. So you have, we're going to set up a, a background check service that's on the blockchain and a escrow service and a smart contract insurance and all of these components that we have right now in the economy, they don't function great and they're expensive and they essentially push all of the payment onto the consumer's end, which sucks. So instead, if we have them in an importable smart contract way on a public blockchain, then you say as entrepreneur want to create a rent and apartment service on the blockchain. So what you would do is you would have a way of showing your listings. And then when somebody wants to rent an apartment, you would import the background check smart contract and you would use it. And for some sort of micro transaction fee, you pay the verifier of the background check directly through their smart contract. You would have some sort of escrow service which you would pay directly, or maybe you just do it built into your smart contract. And these building block components would help you do the part of your real estate apartment rental startup that is most interesting to you, which is figuring out how to expose listings without having to deal with all of these other terrible components that are necessary for a company, like insuring your smart contracts and doing background checks and whatever. So then when we're talking about having these services on a chain, there are a lot of companies that already have these services. They just don't know how to effectively monetize them. Or they're already cost centers from their company that by having an Oracle to public blockchain, they could monetize what's already a cost center for them. So imagine like, I don't know, Chase Bank. Chase Bank already has a department that does background checks. And if they could have a smart contract on the public blockchain where people could pay them to do background checks, they could run that through their pipeline and monetize an existing business unit that right now is only a cost center for them. 
So this is, it's sort of like applying the sharing economy to the components that already make up very large businesses. So this is a way of onboarding Chase Bank onto enterprise blockchain. I'm not saying like, dear Chase Bank, please go in and rip out all of your existing database because they're never going to do that. But instead we can go to them and say, look, let's create a new product that monetizes an existing cost center in your business that doesn't have to connect to any of the rest of your network. That's totally secure. And let's see how it goes, because they're much more likely to try to create a new revenue stream that's disconnected from the rest of their business than they are to try to like rip out the guts of their existing infrastructure. It's super hard to sell that because nobody wants to touch something that's basically working for something that doesn't necessarily have any major advantages. But potential new revenue streams, everybody gets excited for potential new revenue streams. I get that. And I think that's the fundamental issue here. And that's the sort of fundamental problems with the whole premise of enterprise blockchain is that it is orthogonal to the like to 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 try to to um to get Chase Bank to monetize uh an existing service is really orthogonal to the way that they already do business especially when you're opening it up on on a sort of public network and i i think that coming away from my experience in my previous company that it's not so much a technological issue it's not so much about the technology it's really a change management issue and that all this evangelism that uh, you know, all of us have been doing for so you know, all these years in, in, in large companies and enterprise about blockchain technology, I think we've been doing it wrong. And it really comes down to like, what is the future of identity? What is the future of um, payments? What is the future of insurance? What is that going to look like in the future? And And currently, I think most people that are addressing that are talking to innovation departments at banks and financial services companies, insurance, what have you, are not really doing this. They're still spending time saying, oh, well, I mean, look, you could you could take this existing thing, plug a blockchain into it, and then start making money um, in this ecosystem that doesn't, that doesn't exist yet. Um, so I, I guess my question is remains like what what is the what is really the the go to market strategy where have you like sort of identified some key industries or types of clients where you can take Cadena and really provide an out-of-the-box solution to start generating, like to generate revenue and to prove these use cases, right? Because the proof is in the pudding. Sure. I mean, we have two existing clients. We already have a working MVP. I, I don't know what to tell you other than like, we're doing it. And we don't have to pay like some companies like pay people to use POCs. Like people come to us, they want to use our stuff. Sometimes we have to turn people away because they're like, we have this great idea. And we're like, great, but we can't execute it for you. You have to have your own engineering team. We're just going to give you consulting. I'm like, if people aren't ready to go, we're not going to work with them. But right now people are coming to us. Say so they say that we have a thing that works. We do. So what's the what's the roadmap uh, like uh, in the next? Uh, so you mentioned earlier an SDK where people can already start using the platform. Uh, can you talk a bit more about that? Sure. So we've got two teams right now working on both the language development and tooling for developers, and another team that's working on chain web and protocol development. And so we've split them into two test nets. So we're, we're right now working on both of them at the same time. The packed test net is supposed to come up next month where people can see it's going to use a database to generate blocks, but it's essentially going to have all of the bells and whistles for a development environment where people can put their smart contracts up onto our IDE and have error messages and it'll hook up to the formal verification system and this will be more of a simulated experience of what developing on Cadena will be like. And then meanwhile, we're working on chain web testnet, which should be up by the end of the year, which will, it's basically just a way of testing how blocks get generated and forks get resolved in the consensus mechanism. And then we're going to merge them to create a unified testnet when then the goal is to have the mainnet launch around the second quarter of next year. Great. So we'll have links to all that in the show notes. If people are interested, they can uh, go to uh, to the Canadian website, uh, read the white papers, 
uh, which you've uh, you've co-written uh, with your co-founders, and uh, and learn more about how Canada uh, will be uh, building out this uh, this chain web network, and then also uh, implementing uh, their technologies in uh, in enterprise. So thanks, Monica, for coming on the show today. Thanks, guys. This was great. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guest or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.